Hello and welcome to another edition of Active Living. We're very fortunate today to have Dave Bennett here. Dave is a uh, fantastic clarinet player that's been traveling around the world and uh, we'd like to welcome you, Dave. Thanks, George. Glad to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. So you've been, you've been on a trip to Florida, I hear, just got back. That's right. We were in Clearwater and uh, just returned a couple days ago. And uh, we had a wonderful time. The you know, weather was beautiful. The uh, band had a great time. And sure good. had to beat the weather up here anyway. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to uh, where you started. You know, a lot, there's been a lot of uh, talk about, you know, Dave Bennett, this child prodigy, started out as, you know, like, like seven or eight, nine years old, and uh -huh. your grandfather gave you a, a, an LP and a clarinet and said, go play some, uh, some uh, you know, Benny Goodman music. Uh -huh. So how about that? Was that is that true? Uh, well, kind of. Uh, I joined the band in fifth grade. I was, okay. I was 10 years old. And, you know, I, I didn't think I'd be any good. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about music, but it seemed kind of interesting to play an instrument. So the way it happened was my grandfather just said to me, I think you'd have fun playing the clarinet. Yeah. No one played clarinet in my family. Um, I think he just thought it would give me a, a good hobby. Okay. And um, I learned later on, he told me that he didn't know it would lead to anything like this. He thought it might end, end up in the toy box a few months later. You know? Right. So he and my grandma went down to the, the pawn shop down in Pontiac, and got me a, a plastic con clarinet. And um, I had always liked music from the 40s, even prior to this, because I used right. to watch Abbott and Costello and the Three Stooges, I, so I heard the music. And about a week later, they bought me a cassette tape of Benny Goodman, just thinking that I'd get a kick out of hearing what this instrument could do. Right. And, you know, I, I heard that music and, and put that together with this newfound instrument that I had. And I don't know how to say it, but uh, I just knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Really? I didn't know you could make a living at it. I didn't know if you could, could or couldn't, but something inside me just felt really complete when I put those things together. And so that's, that's how that all began. So did you, were you taking lessons at the time? Or were you yeah, just taking, I, I, like, okay, from so, the school? Yeah, I was taking uh, uh, music in fifth grade band. Uh, right. But the, the guy who started me off, Jamie, Jamie McLeod, he only taught fifth grade that one year. He was band director at Waterford Kettering High School. Okay. Time. And I think at the time he was about 27 years old, played clarinet too. And he was a Benny Goodman nut. Okay. And um, he was he, he master clarinet player. The guy's unreal. So I think being under his guidance, because I would learn a new song of Benny's each week or something, a, a little piece of music of Benny's, I'd come back and play it for him and he'd critique it. And, and, um, now, did you learn this by ear? Yeah. By listening to it? You yeah. Know, you weren't reading music. You were just kind of, I, you know, I hear this song and I think I can play it. Right. I, I think that the ear was always stronger than my yeah. re reading abilities. So each week I would learn something by listening to a cassette tape. Okay. Whereas my sight reading always <laughs> lagged far behind. <laughs> um, it's always a challenge, isn't it? It is. It's a challenge to try to keep both of them the same. Well, you yeah. know, the problem is is some people get dependent on sight reading and they can't play jazz. I, I guess They'll that's They'll never true. play jazz because right. they're too dependent on the notes. Right. But learning the other way, you, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be a stronger jazz player, I for sure. hope so. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so... So you got you you basically went through high school and did your thing uh, mm -hmm. in the high school band. Yeah, I, I'm sure you were probably featured in playing first chair and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, my teachers were always really good uh, to me, even through middle school and high school. I'd always get a solo spot at each concert, right? And um, they used that program, Band in a Box, which I know you use. I use it now, right? And so I didn't have any musicians to perform with at that time, but they would program the band in the box for me and I go up there and play it play these songs at each concert and <laughs> it was it was fun. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you go through high school, you get and and, and during this time you're going to school, mm -hmm. you're like 12, 13 years old. You're starting to play out with some of the local musicians, right? By the time I was 14, uh, I started playing professionally when I was 13, but that was still using the band in a box okay. pro program. Okay. Um, but when I was 14, I met our mutual friend Dave Tatro. Okay. And yeah. um, uh, he, he let me sit in with, with the new Reformation band. Uh -huh. And then um, they asked me to join them on a trip to California when I was 14. And so that 
that experience got the ball rolling as far as me meeting other musicians to play with. And, and playing professionally with, yeah. with, with, the, with the pros, basically, at right. 14. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was learning on the bandstand. I, right. And that, was, that was really, it was really intense, really fun, and, um, you know, it really kept you on your toes because it's kind of like being thrown out into the ocean. You know? <laughs> yeah. Start off at a, at a young age in front of big crowds. It was, it was, it was great. I mean, they were, they were really helpful to me and, and kind of coached me along. Yeah. Yeah. Now, does he still call you the kid? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? With each passing year, I welcome it more and more. <laughs> <Yeah. You know? laughs> it's great. But uh, so anyway, you're now you're you've you've started your own group. You played with Dave and the, the, the also the band he had with Wally's Warehouse Waifs. Right. I know you were on that recording. Yeah. And I saw. As a matter of fact, I went to uh, uh, Davenport to see you guys play out there. That's right. Years a few years ago. Yes. Yeah, because uh, when when he left the New Reformation band, he started that band, and then. I was with the New Reformation Band, and as they were backing off the road work, he brought me on with them, so I kind of made that transition, and I was about 20 years old or so. Okay. Yeah. So in addition to doing that, you also you went to college and got a degree. I did. In, uh, I got a bachelor's and a master's in accounting. Fantastic. I, I never did it for a living. Right. I, I don't have any experience in the real world as far as that profession goes. but. Well, you do if you're running a band. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> helped me with the business end of things. Right. I mean, I, I'm by no means an expert, but um, some of those those business principles have helped me at least be organized and on top of contracts and budgets and, right. and planning and things like that. Yeah. And when I don't know what to do, I, I know the right people to call. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Sure. So now you you've uh, you're playing with a new Reformation band. You've played now with Wally's Warehouse Waves, and you're, you know, you're, I assume you're doing these festivals all over the country, because I know Dave was traveling quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And you're doing, uh, I just, just recently you've done, what, one in California, one in Arizona, one here? We did, one um, in Florida? Yeah, we did, we did one in Florida, we did two in California, one in British Columbia, and then we did one in Sun Valley, Idaho. So you've been traveling around. It's been a busy, busy season. Yeah. Yeah. Now this quartet, after you uh, after you finished with Dave mm -hmm. in his group, and you still play with him occasionally, mm -hmm. I see. Yep. But you started your own group. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Well, even through the times that I had the I was with the New Reformation Band, I always did have a quartet. Okay. And it it took on various incarnations with different musicians and everything. Um, I would say probably around 2017 is when the current um, personnel that I have kind of became a, more of a, a permanent thing. Right. And um, so I would say the quartet has really gained traction since around 2017. It's doing very well. It is. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I love those guys with everything I have. We, we, we have a great relationship. And, and with each passing year, the band seems to, the book is growing. We're yeah. getting more of an identity. Uh, it, it's just, I absolutely love playing with those guys. I'm going to step back just a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, talk to me about uh, Paul Keller and arrangements uh -huh. for uh, symphony orchestra. Yeah. Uh, can you talk to us a, a little bit about what happened there, how that got started? Yeah, well, I, I met Paul when I was a teenager, and we formed a, a pretty good friendship, and um, then. I got an agent uh, that started booking us with symphony pops shows, where my band would combine with a symphony and right. play music of the swing era or rock and roll era or whatever have you. And um, so Paul and I got together and uh, he started writing out these these symphonic arrangements for us to, to play. And uh, that was another level of, of excitement uh, on many levels because number one, you, you get to play surrounded by a, a, a 60 piece symphony. Right. And um, so playing the music that you usually play with a small group suddenly amplified this big. Yeah. And then you're playing in, in all these amazing concert halls around the country and so you're kind of thrust into a even higher stratosphere and um, those shows are always really special. 
Are you still doing those at all? Uh, there haven't been many lately. Okay. Um, but uh, it's just kind of the way the scene goes. Sometimes there's ebbs and yeah, flows. Yeah. But you've done uh, Detroit Symphony, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. you, but you've also played in Carnegie Hall, is that correct? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, it was the uh, 75th anniversary of the Benny Goodman 1938 Carnegie Hall concert. And um, it was just one of those things that dreams are made of. I mean, when yeah. I was when I was 10 years old and learned about Benny Goodman and then him playing at Carnegie Hall, that was always that dream, that, that right. thing inside you. That's a someday, could that ever happen? Someday I want to play Sing, Sing, Sing in Carnegie yeah. Hall, just like <laughs> Benny Goodman did, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you just, you know, you, you fantasize about those things. So it happened. And um, it was just a night to remember. The, the place was packed and got to play Benny's music. and. Uh, is something very special. Uh, it would be, yeah. I would think. Yeah. Now you also just recently played in uh, in the New York City as one of the jazz clubs. Yeah, we um, we went to Birdland in Times Square, and that was in March of 22. So there was about a, a nine year gap till we made a return trip to New York, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that was incredible. You know, because because by that point. Playing with the quartet at Birdland, we had formed our own identity, right. and I got I got to perform some of my own music there. It mixed in with the classics that we always right. have done, and so that was that was really special. Birdland, I can remember when I was going to young guy a few years ago. <laughs> we used to go to Birdland every time we had a break at college. I was I lived in Vermont at the time, okay. and we used to. I had a friend that lived right outside of New York City, and we used uh -huh. to travel down there and go to Birdland and, uh, you know, listen to the, the great groups down there, and it was fantastic. I mean, we saw Cal Basie, we saw Maynard Ferguson's early, early Birdland Dream Band, and just a whole host of different people yeah. coming down there. And you're, you're now at the, the status symbol of playing <laughs> at, 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 a, at one of the best clubs in the, in the city. It was, I'm very grateful for it. Yeah, it was wonderful. Wow, how'd you get booked in there? My my agent's a very good friend of the owner. Oh, fantastic! And um, you know, she she was talking to him and said, you know, I think Dave offers something really unique, and because we with not just the clarinet but the different st styles that we throw into a show. Right. And he was said, well, I'd like to book something in here that's a little different. So they found a date uh, to do it, and she says, you want to do it? I says, absolutely. <laughs> so, and the, the the neat thing was a lot of my friends and family from here in Michigan made the trip out to New York to support us. And then I have a lot of f family that lives in New York from White Plains, and they all came down uh, to see the show. That's fantastic. And uh, it was something else. Yeah. Really good. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. So, now I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, you, t you talked about playing different styles. Uh -huh. um, You've, you seem to have gravitated a little bit towards Jerry Lee. I love Jerry Lee. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, all that stuff. Um, when I, I can remember very vividly, and my memory for some reason is very clear at a very young age, but I think the first music I was ever exposed to was music of the 50s. Right. And I, so that sound has always been in there. I've always loved it. And um, about a year after I started playing clarinet, and doing the whole big band swing thing, uh, I kind of rekindled that memory of Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, right. Chuck Berry, and Roy Orbison. So um, throughout my teen years, I, that was always my other passion that I was working on at home while I was performing clarinet in public. Right. So in the course of time, I, I taught myself to play the guitar and the piano and and even even in my teen years, when I would play a, a quartet show or a jazz show, I might sneak in one Elvis Presley sure. tune. And I used to do that with with Tatro, with the yeah. New Reformation band. They would we'd do an Elvis Presley song. They'd, they'd feature me on. So it's always been there. And then eventually, I had the guts enough to <laughs> to, to do it more. To do it in public. Right? Yeah, and um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to do all that different stuff because I love it all. Right. Yeah. 
Well, the uh, you know you you've got you've got a great act when you do your uh, Jerry Leith routine, <laughs> and uh, people love it. Well, that's that's you, the main know, thing. You know, they just love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it, number one, if it, it makes me happy to listen to it and play it. But then when you see everybody else get charged up. It, People get up and dance. It's they the have great, a ball. You know? It's the greatest thing in the world. It's we were wonderful. just up at, um, well, you played up at, uh, in Potosi. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you start playing that stuff, man, people get up and they dance and they have a great time. Yeah. You know? It, it's just wonderful. I, I just, it puts a nice exclamation point on the end of the night. Even yeah. I got up. I'm, yeah, I know. I saw you. You were, <laughs> that's good. That's Crazy. what we want. Yeah. <laughs> so. So yeah, but um, so you do you do the you do that routine you do you now you've you've written uh, talk to me about some of the music you've written. Okay. You know you I know you you guest you were guest artist with the North Oakland Concert Band mm -hmm. uh, a year or two ago, and you played a couple of your original original songs at that mm -hmm. time. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you st you started thinking about well, maybe I should do my own thing. Well, the first song I wrote was when I was 17. Okay. It was a song called Lonesome Highway, which we do quite a bit these days. Right. But it's kind of a Roy Orbison styled song. Mm -hmm. And I was really proud of that song, but it took me probably 10 years to write another one. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, okay. you know, writing. You just didn't put your mind to it. You no, I tried. Oh, did you? I, I tried all the time. and and. I didn't know how, I didn't think that it was something that I maybe could ever do again. So really? I used to see people that wrote music and ideas would flow and I thought, could that ever happen again? I don't know. So anyway, um, I wrote a, a country tune 10 years later. And so I had, now I had two songs. Yep. <laughs> and then when I was about 30 or 31, was around the time being signed to Mac Avenue Records that they suggested for my next project, I do an album that contains original material. Right. I thought, okay. Now the pressure is well, okay. on, right? Yeah, and I hadn't <laughs> written anything for the clarinet yet. Okay. So I didn't know if I could do this. Well, my very good friend of mine, Shelley Berger, who lives in Toronto, he's, this guy is an amazing arranger, an amazing composer, and we had, he had done the arrangements for my previous record. Mm -hmm. And I said, Shelley, you know, this is what they want to do would you like to collaborate on this? And he said, well, yeah. So we spent initially about a week, he came here to Michigan, and we just kept banging our heads against the wall, trying to come up with something. And then he would sit at the, at the keyboard. Right. And I'd be at the clarinet, and I'd start recording. Everything we would just improvise mm -hmm. and come up with. So we had a drum machine going, and we were listening to a Phil Collins record, looking for inspiration. Right. And this one, this one song kind of ignited a mood, so we stopped it, and Shelley started playing at the piano. And I, I, I have proof of this. <laughs> Somehow he came up with the main riff that's now Blood Moon. Okay. And when he came up with that, I remember this feeling kind of happened with both of us, and then I just started playing, and we wrote half the tune just playing off of each other. Okay. And we got done and we looked at each other and went, I think we can do this. So when we had that one good idea, right. that gave us both enough confidence, I think we can write together. And um, so for over the next year, we would get together periodically and, and write together. And, and then once the project came out, he arranged it all for, for a small group. We went, we went to Toronto to, to record. And um, I think by me working with him and, and learning what he does harmonically mm -hmm. and, and studying his arrangements, I, it's been a great learning process for me. So it's given me more of a, a language musically to draw from to compose things myself. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how that ball got rolling. But it was extremely slow at first and it was extremely tough because I, I didn't know if I could do it. And to be honest with you, I wonder if I can still do it because I know I have to get writing again. You know, it's going to come mm -hmm. time where I need to make a new record. Right. But it's writing music to me a lot of times is like pulling teeth because <laughs> you'll sit there, at least for me, sometimes a week or two, 
and you're trying to come up with an idea, and when nothing happens, it's just the most frustrating thing in the world. But then once you get an idea, yeah, it's wonderful. Then, but it's, yeah. I just, it's to face that, <laughs> it's like this monster is waiting for you in this music room, that clarinet or that piano that's just saying, let's see if you can do this today, you know? Right, right. <laughs> And, and you um, find every excuse in the world not to sit down and do it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I need to wash that window, or I got I got to do that. I got a vacuum or something. Yeah, something. Right. right. So it's just part of the human aspect of it, yeah. I guess. But what? The, but the final product comes out. It's great. It I mean, sure we is. did uh, one of your. We, we did Blood Moon. I That's think right. with uh, North Oakland Concert Band. Yeah. And your piano player, Jeff. Yeah, it's Kressler. Uh, yeah. Did the arrangement for it. Yes, he did. And it was a great job. Yeah. You know, it's it was terrific. I, maybe that's just the thing, being willing to say, okay, the frustration is part of the process, and just, just face it, and on the other side, there's beauty. Yeah, but, <laughs> somewhere but somewhere out there, right? There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of bombs waiting to go there, you know, and so. So, what are you looking at in the, in the, in the future? I mean, you, you've, you've done the symphony thing, mm -hmm. you've done the jazz thing, you, you, have you got any t plans to do anything that is Big, a big difference from what you've been doing, or do you want to just keep kind of doing these festivals and keep doing your thing? Well, I think the, the next goal is for me to write more. Okay. Uh, the next record I do will, because the last record I did was all original music, but it was more guitar based. Okay. Which uh, I'm really happy with the way that came out, but I think the next album will be another clarinet album, probably with more originals. Um, I'm not quite sure where that's going to go. Maybe some vocals? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. You know, um, you don't really know what's going to happen until you're actually in the process of, of, yeah. of making or creating for the record. But I, I think my goal is to more or less have my music become better known. Or perhaps, uh, or, you know, we're pitching some of it to be used for film or TV, too. Um, so that's one aspect of it. There's a lot of different things I got going on that I want to do, and I'm, it's a little overwhelming at the moment. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, yeah. But things seem to be falling into place a little bit more. So and another project I'm going to be working on is my my pastor and I, uh, Tom Hampton, who's an amazing guitarist and singer. We're going to be cutting an album together. I've seen I've seen some videos that you've done with Tom. Yeah, and we've been talking about this for years, and I think now is the time. So great. We're planning on putting out a duo album. That would be fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so we'll see where that takes us too. More, um, more Christian-based music. Yeah, some. You know, and then there's there's a lot of songs that we'll play in church that are not necessarily gospel songs, but they're about they're about real life. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. um, which really seem to perhaps hit people where where they're at. Uh -huh. You know, and right. um, so a lot of the things that we've played in church over the last five six years, we'll we'll put on the album, and. Um, See where that goes, but I, I've been really looking forward to that. That, That'd that be sounds wonderful. like it could be a lot of fun. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So you now that you've um, you've done all of these things, you've got uh, a, a little bit of a plan. Uh, it sounds like you got a full plate. Yeah. You know, with everything you got going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's not a boring life at all. <laughs> yeah, I, it's I'm the richest guy in the world. Yeah. I I, I love. I love every day and, um, you know, being self-employed too, I mean, my the job never stops, so it's, um, it's sun up to sun down, but boy, it's great. You got, you've got an agent that uh, helps you find, you know, work these gigs. Yep, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, um, I have a manager now. For a lot of years, I didn't. Really? And I, I did a lot of things myself and it, it was just killing me because <laughs> there's only so many hours in the day. I know. Um, Running a band is uh, not an easy, easy task. No, it's especially it, if you're playing as much as you are. Yeah, you got to be really diligent about every every detail detail because if you miss one little thing, the whole operation can go right off the tracks. Yep. Um, but I have a good team of people now that that I trust, and um, I feel like I'm in good hands. And now since I have that. The pressure's off a little bit, and I can focus back more on the creativity. Yeah, and uh, that's been a real blessing. You know, it sounds like a challenge, but it sounds like it's worth it when you get oh, through the so. process, yeah, right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, listen, Dave, it's been great talking to you. Well, thank you, George. And it's been, a, <laughs> you know, it's been a terrific. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Well, thanks for and having me finally on. finally caught up with you. Oh, hey, it's, it's, this is an honor. Appreciate it. But thanks for uh, joining us. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for being with us today. It's been a great show with Dave. Thanks for, again for coming. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.